All right, hi guys. This is our great panel. All right, um, first of all, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I'll, uh, I, think, I think we should start with uh, a short round of in introductions, if you don't mind, so please. Do I start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Ben Bone from RVX, so you just got Davi earlier, now you get me. Get a double dose of RVX this morning. Uh, I was in the gaming industry for uh, uh, almost 15 years uh, before switching. I was at CCP before that and before that company called 3 Plus uh, uh, back in the early 2000s. And uh, since this year I joined RVX, so visual effects for film with now the new path towards uh, VR as well. So very interesting kind of pivoting for me. It's a uh, uh, a whole uh, evolution slash revolution for everyone and uh, too exciting not to give it a shot. So yeah, I'm based in Reykjavik uh, and I'm passionate about VR, games, film, the whole thing is amazing. Uh, I am Kai Am and I dabble in VR. I've retired from VR in 2014 and returned uh, just this year in March. Um, I used to be the Chief Innovation Officer at Immersive Media. Immersive Media is the company that uh, created the technology behind Google Street View. Uh, they were re recently uh, acquired by Digital Domain. So that gave me a, a great uh, foundation for uh, 360 video uh, live uh, streaming of it and moving into now VR. Uh, I'm now currently at a company called Live Planet um, and what we've done is we've created uh, a three-step process to um, basically make the, uh, the world of producing 360 content much easier. The camera is a, a stereoscopic camera. We've got a cloud and a delivery system to it. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, full, I'm full on back into VR and uh, loving it. Uh, for those that weren't here for me, I'm Brett Leonard, uh, director of the Lawnmower Man, Virtuosity, and I now I'm the chief creative officer for Virtuosity Entertainment. Uh, we're creating immersive interactive story worlds, uh, next phase of VR content. Thank you. Um, as uh, I'd like to sort of give you an idea of what I, what I uh, am, what I do, and, and as a journalist going around uh, tech conferences, especially in emerging tech, you know, VR, AR, obviously, um, fintech and all that, so I hear a lot of, I see a lot of brilliant minds talking about their respective fields uh, to audiences that are usually in their respective fields. So uh, I see some, some form of a disconnect between, you know, um, let's say the bubble of, of, of professionals in that field and then the wider audience um, for which, you know, you make these, you know, make the tech and, and all these innovations. So I'd like to understand in the context of filmmaking and, and entertainment, why, why should the masses, why should the the movie-going audiences care about VR as a sort of a buzzword, keyword. Isn't, really, isn't, isn't it all about just making entertainment and VR is just part of it and we don't really need to talk about it in, in, the, in that context? Um, well, I think that VR is not just going to be entertainment. It's uh, going to be something that transforms almost every sector uh, of human uh, communication and activity. and. Uh, it's, it's so disruptive that it's almost hard to get a view of what it does because you have to pull back so far to see it. I think that entertainment will be sort of the sizzle layer that sort of brings it to the public. But I think um, areas like in medicine, uh, you know, uh, behavioral therapy, things like that, uh, we actually have many people from those disciplines on our team in virtuosity because... Uh, as I talked about a little in my talk, it's truly going to be the most multidisciplinary medium in history. And, you know, it's uh, in one of the big um, reports by, it was either Goldman Sachs or one of those kind of companies, they talked about it, you know, this is not a peripheral. This is not like a mouse or a, a, a display. This is like the beginning of PC computing. It's a whole new platform of computing and of understanding how humans interact with data and with themselves. So it's it's, it's truly huge, and that's one of the reasons I think that's a, there's a disconnect. Right, right. It's probably even too huge, and like the, the title of the, it's too huge to be comprehended, yes. even by most of us still yes. at this point. And when you say, for example, should the moviegoers care about it or be interested by it, 
it's such an abstract question. It doesn't even relate because when you say that, you make a connection between filmmaking and VR experiences, and it's two different things completely. And just like you were describing earlier, like the fact that we need to shape this whole thing, we need to create it from the ground up. It doesn't exist yet. It's not like a land grab. It's not a land, it's technology. And you, it's not something that exists and you go there and claim it. You know, you have to build it and you have to create it while you're doing that. And the whole theme and discussion about like filmmaking in VR and things like that is, is very um, uh, illogical as a discussion because uh, it implies that you want to try to replicate something in a new format. And it's not the case. It's not what's going to happen there. And the way you make films today, the, the way fi uh, you were talking about, you know, the fact, the, the fact that the way we make and, and produce movies today is like from 1930s, you know, it's just like the train that Dali was throwing as well. In stereo, 1935. Nothing has changed much since then. And the thing is that all those things don't apply to VR and cannot apply to VR. And to create this new thing, it's just like when you do software development, and a lot of people here, of course, are familiar with that, it's about iteration and it's about failure. You need to fail in order to discover and create and find solutions. And the big problem that uh, uh, is right on the overlap between VR and Hollywood at the moment is that Hollywood is not made to fail, it doesn't accept failures. It's not gonna say like, oh, you know, let's fail on like five movies until we nail it down and we find the recipe, because it doesn't work like that. You're not gonna spend five times $200 million until you find the, the solution. It doesn't work like that. And that's why it's up to us and all the people that can back uh, uh, our initiative and our creativity with funding, of course, to accept this cycle of discovering and mastering the technology and developing it through failures and you know just like bell said you know i didn't i didn't fail 10000 times before i found the light bulb i just found 10000 ways that don't work and that's right. what we need to go through right at the moment yeah, and just like the lumiere brothers uh, I, I don't think they understood what was what the impact of uh, having moving pictures and i don't know if they ran out of the studio i do believe they ducked um, uh, i i'm not too sure but i can always go back to the future and find out um, but yeah, what, what they did was they created a form of entertainment and, and one is, uh, you know, if you go to a movie, it's, it's a story, whereas VR or th those kinds of things is an experience. That story can be an experience, but you're feeling something, you're getting a visceral reaction from that. I mean, great storytellers will make you cry, they will make you scared, they will do all of these things, they'll, you know, um, evoke all of these emotions from you. But VR, you can put that on and they don't even, the storyteller uh, doesn't even have to tell a story. You're just in the environment and that's the narrative itself and that's the experience. So I think we're, we, we have no idea where this is going to go. And just like the Lumiere brothers, they had no idea where it was going to go. That was 100 years. Uh, the innovation or the diffusion of innovation, um, that curve is, is always going to be the same. But the time that it, uh, that it takes to go from the beginning to the end uh, is getting shorter and shorter as we go. So, as you were saying, um, we're going to have iterations on this and we'll just continue impro improving upon it. Right, okay. Um, as uh, Brett, you mentioned that um, VR is not only about uh, entertainment, uh, obviously. I just, I'm trying to keep the sort of conversation about Hollywood, Hollywood and filmmaking, right. <laughs> and, and obviously I, I agree with you. Um, but I think some of, some of the things you said here uh, sort of validate my point about the disconnect. Um, and I, I would say that you know um, this this the, the speed of innovation. It's sort of uh, I wrote down that that it's it's a, it's a the battle of tech is is happening behind the scenes. It's it's uh, the race to the top is is something we don't see. We don't have to see. The audiences shouldn't care about that. So there is there is that um, which you know uh, is something that doesn't doesn't really uh, play out there in, in, in with the, with the masses. So. You, you, you know what I mean? Like, you see this, this kind of uh, uh, thing happening that... Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, it's really important to, as I was talking about my talk, to, to create context for the medium right now. Um, I mean, I, I did experience this. I experienced millions of people getting into something that they had no idea about until they saw my movie about it. And, you know, funnily enough, I mean, that movie, if you went to the studios today and said, I want to make a movie about a technology that nobody knows about right now, uh, but it's really groovy. 
It's cool. Right. Uh, there's no way they'd make that movie. I mean, it, it's, it's, it was sort of the last time when you could do something like that. And uh, now it's important for us now that the actual tech exists enough to be, um, you know, as your partner said, to be, to be quality enough to, for, to create experiences that people will want. We have to set the context. If we went out in the street right now and started asking people, why do you think you need VR? I mean, it would be a very large percentage that go, huh? I mean, they wouldn't understand even what we're talking about. I think this is one of the biggest issues of the disconnect in the industry. It's in a bubble. It is, it, we're all drinking the Kool-Aid. We're, we're, uh, we're excited about it. But in order to, you know, you put normal 360 video uh, content uh, on a normal person, and unless something really astonishing is happening, uh, you know, like there's a, there's a demo out there by a company that I won't name uh, that uh, is uh, got Paul McCartney on a stage playing uh, in a concert. Okay, well, you look at Paul McCartney, you look at the, you got the lights, you got the, down to the floor, you got the audience. Unless people are having like sex right over there, I'm not good, I'm bored. I mean, it's just, I mean, there's got to be something going on that is more than just looking around. And I think that that's one of the biggest misnomers that's going on right now. And so we have to find these new conventions, uh, as, as we're talking about just in the previous talk, because that, those conventions are going to be the thing that draws an audience in. We have to make the medium. When, uh, you know, Hollywood, when it was the beginning, we had the Nickelodeon, then one reelers, and then D.W. Griffith came along and made this idea of the feature film. Everyone thought he was nuts. Everyone thought, no one's going to watch a movie for two hours, that's crazy. They're not, they're gonna, you know, their butts are gonna itch, they're gonna get up, they're gonna wanna, you know, not st sit there and be en engaged. Of course, that created the entire industry of Hollywood that we're talking about right now. So Hollywood needs to reinvent itself right now. As a matter of fact, if you look at box office numbers, it's a contracting business. It's going the wrong direction. Of course, Wall Street really doesn't like that. So we have to reinvent what Hollywood is into Hollywood 2.0, into something that is embracing the creation of a new medium. Because the people that ran the original studios, they had cojones. They had, the, they had you know, a, a power and a passion to want to create something. Right now, it's a very risk-averse business. It's a risk-averse environment. And a new medium in a risk-averse environment, that's a misnomer. That's a disconnect. Right. Um, and and what, I, what I've recognized in, in, in Hollywood is when they're transitioning from this framed um, storytelling world and they're going into an omnidirectional world, um, it doesn't compute, you know, it, it's, it's going from a framed world into a, a frameless world and it's a technology that, that needs to be understood. Now what's, the, what's holding back 360 video or stereoscopic video or VR or whatever it is, live action, is the quality. We're used to a, an amazing quality with 4K video that's on our television. We look at it and we're like, wow, that's amazing pixel density. Or maybe that's what I say. I don't know if you guys say that. <laughs> but I sit there and go, wow, that's an amazing uh, picture quality. And that's what everyone's used to. And then you strap a pair of goggles on someone and they go, wait a sec, this is 4K? Why does it have all of these pixels in it? So we have to, I mean, there's, there's all these innovations that are coming about. But Hollywood's not going to ca catch on until the price points of these headsets go down and the quality of the, the video goes up. So we're getting to that point. If, uh, you know, y y lots of people have children, some of you here have children, and I'm sure they've wanted something, and if they didn't get it, they dropped to the floor and had a, uh, a, you know, a conniption. They started flailing and crying, I want that, I want that. For $799, you can cry all you want. I'm never gonna buy you that headset. But $299, I might. Samsung Gear, 99 sure. You don't even have to cry, you can just whine a little. So when, when it gets from $800 down to $200 and the, the kids are getting the, the, these headsets, that's when you start, hitting, you, you start seeing that, those conversions. And then now we're getting to the point where you know, we do have 4K video on 360 and you can actually get viewporting so that it's actually good. So that's the, that's the, the, the part of it is educating and giving people what they expect or, or what they already have. So on television is amazing. VR isn't where television is, it has to reach to that point, and it's getting very, very close. So in the next two years, you'll get to that point and you'll see a massive adoption. PlayStation's coming on board, they'll have a headset. They have 40 million people that are already gung-ho on this. So um, they're gonna be playing video games, but I can now port in live action into there. I can, I can watch that, them in a gaming conference. I mean, they've got Madison Square Gardens packed um, full of gamers, um, I think in two days and people are live streaming the gaming and they're live streaming the actual venue that they're gaming from. So 
Once the once the point where it gets to everyone is uh, it's cheaper and the, the, the better quality, then Hollywood actually pick up. But they'll still experiment. Right. W would you say that? I mean, sort of touching on on that point, that Hollywood should. Uh, instead of uh, manufacturing demand, they should sort of tap into the existing framework, the existing culture and, and habits and, and all that to create something rather than inventing something new. I mean, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, right now we have duct tape solutions. Both. Yeah, we have duct tape solutions, and, and now we have to get to the point where you get that seamlessness. Once that seamlessness occurs, then you'll get that. Right, but if we sort of look at the evolution of how, how things beca became popular, I, I think I mentioned uh, yesterday when we were talking, uh, Peter Novak's uh, book Sex, Bombs and Burgers, where he sort of lists all these all this different things that became, became huge, and, and many of them were driven by things like sex. So do you see that VR really, for example, uh, let's say the porn industry would be the, the, the sort of torchbearer. Already torch happening. Of, right. Already But in, ter in terms of the, the, the guys, let's say the guys are the, t the early adopters. So, you know, if they go from, they, they use VR for these purposes, um, that, you know, would mean that they would then use that for other purposes as well. Do you see this as... as yeah, kind of I, I mean... I've always believed that uh, military and uh, pornography is, are, are going to initiate the innovation and what actually gets it mainstay or, or to the masses is advertising. And right now Hollywood is the advertising as well as the agencies because Hollywood's advertising the fact that this is the new world. We're going to jump into this. We're dumping so much money into producing content. It's shitty content, but we're still producing it. You have to go through those iterations to get it to good content. So I think that's, uh, the advertising is going to prove that, and Hollywood right now is that because they're advertising how much money they're putting into it, and it causes this uh, chain reaction. But a lot of it is still very conservative, and it's really very. risk averse, and that's the, that's the main problem. There is, for example, one thing that is not really addressed in all that. Sure, a lot of 360, a lot of like immersive, a, a, a passive experience, but go. virtual reality as in an in a alternate uh, a dimension, there is very little done about that, despite the amount of money that is being poured in all those things. There is one thing that needs to be redefined as well. For example, it's the place of the, of, of the viewer, of the spectator. Are you still just a viewer? Are you invisible in virtual reality? When you think about storytelling and fiction, like, you know, it's, it, like for example, in a 360 video, I'm static. So, yes, I'm a camera, basically. My head is a 360 camera. If I do like that, the whole box moves with me. It's a spherical screen around me. When I'm in, re uh, uh, in a real virtual uh, uh, environment, I can step aside and actually step aside. Suddenly, I'm there. I'm not just a witness, I'm there. And then as a spectator, for example, I start to ask myself, oh, do they see me? Like, if I'm in this scene, I am there. And if I suddenly, by doing that, see that I actually move in this space, suddenly I'm there. Does it mean that he sees me, or am I just a spectator? Am I an observer, and therefore do I affect the story that I'm witnessing? It's just like quantum physics. When you observe a particle, you change the environment, and that's why you cannot uh, uh, measure at the same time position and velocity of a particle. And you have this concept suddenly in virtual reality where if I'm standing in a scene and those two guys having a, a sharing a, a very intimate uh, 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 moment, is it going to change the fact that myself and my whole family is also standing in the scene because we're watching the story? Are they going to change it? Are they going to look at me suddenly like, oh shit, like, we need to change that. <laughs> you know, you know all good. these things is also part of it. Like as a spectator, do I become an actor even without interacting just the fact that I'm there? I don't act the same way uh, I would act if nobody was in the room. You know, this is all the context that affects me and the others right, as well. Right. Yeah, I, you know, what, what you're bringing up is, I, I really believe that people from gaming understand this much better um, because th these questions, and you, you get, get into a room in Hollywood and start talking this, and they just yeah. literally go, uh, who's my lunch with? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know. I mean, and, and I, what I'm fascinated by is the convergence of these ideas with qualities of cinematic theory that actually can relate, not cinematic language, but some things like cinematic theory. Like in cinematic theory, there's this idea of off-screen space. Off-screen space is what happens in the story that we don't see, and we use that as a way of shorthanding stories because cinematic storytelling is inherently shorthand. Uh, but in virtual reality, that becomes a real estate that you can explore. So there are things about cinema that if you turn it upside down, start to actually have a quality of 
of seeing what these conventions might be connected to the idea of these ideas which come out of the agency of gameplay. And it's that, the, the, the greatest meetings I have are with people like you where we sit there and go through these kinds of conversations and suddenly a sideways idea comes up that we never would have thought of individually because we're smashing together our language systems. And that quality of doing that is what it's going to take to create this new medium. I believe that you know what I'm out there doing is looking for uh, both the technology, the creative people, and the money that is willing to be part of the future. Because here's the, here's the ask. Do you want to be part of creating the future, or do you just want to follow? Because right now, there's enough that exists that if we had the proper funding, we had, I'm, I'm chasing Viver, very expensive VR. Because it's got to be, it's got to be something that is, we're bringing the same quality that we're bringing to a movie like uh, Gravity. We have to bring that quality to actual virtual experience in order for it to become a mass market phenomenon. Right. So, so when you go to, uh, I guess you meet Hollywood studio heads you know, every week. I do. So when you go to them and you pitch and you talk about the future and how amazing it is, are they, are they there? Do they care? Do they listen? Are they responsive? Are they saying like, yes, let's do it? And, and, and also on that point, how can they, if they go and, and do it, how can they botch it, or will they? Well, part of, part of what we're doing at my company, Virtuosity, is we have mm -hmm. a consultancy uh, for Hollywood studios, entertainment companies, and brands. Um, and they come to ask us, what is this VR thing and how should we do it? Even if they have heads of VR, they still want to you know, hear about other, other p p points of view. Of course, what we have to tell them often is something that they want to push it into a box that fits what they already know about their business, as opposed to, because when you go tell a, a business, you've got to totally recreate yourself and turn upside down everything you know about production process. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a tough moment for them. But you're also asking them to take risks. I mean, every, every business, I mean, they're not charities. They want to make money, and, and no one wants to be the first, the first one to, to try out something new, right? But if like, you are you the can't really blame one. them for but that. But if you are the first one, how marvelous. You know, that's the, that's the and thing. World's like, first. <laughs> and then you go bankrupt. Well, you know, there, there, if you fail, of there's course. a course, and, yeah. but the, there are ways of mitigating that risk, and that's why I'm focused on doing hybrid projects, which have a traditional media component, and yet have an organic VR aspect that actually is the, is the source of the, of the narrative, of the characters, of the assets that are used to create the TV show or the feature film. By doing this hybrid approach right now, which I think is going to be very essential for the next five years, you're actually able to mitigate your risk because you've got a, a product that's working, that can work in a marketplace that's proven. And yet, you're driving it from this idea of VR. As a matter of fact, I go a little further, the projects are actually about VR. They're actually about the medium itself, self-reflexive in that sense, so that it's creating that market expectation for something and then following through and actually delivering it. So that, I think, is the way in which you can get around some of these catch-22s, because they are catch-22s, right. but it's a new medium. And, and again, as I've said, how often do we get this chance? This right. is an amazing opportunity to define something new that can change the world. Yeah, and we're still also too often, we've seen a lot of people contacting us, for example, with our background in film and, and then co-producing Everest VR with, with Solfar Studio. So we, we're really at the merging of like film and uh, uh, VR experiences. So we do have a lot of people from those different backgrounds that contact us for to discuss projects and, and, and things like that. And I see still very often uh, the approach to VR is uh, okay, we have this IP or this project, we need to do something VR about it. Because VR is the shit, so we have to do something about it. And that's the wrong thing. It's just like sitting down and saying like, okay, I really want to write a book. No, you, you write a book or you make a film when you have a story. Right. And that's the result of it. You know, it's the baby of that relationship you have with the story in your head. And that's what happens. But you, you, you know, the end result and the medium serves, you know, some books don't work as a movie and some movies would be a horrible book. Right. And some things are fantastic as a, as, a, uh, as a graphic novel and some things will be fantastic in VR and totally suck in other mediums and vice versa. So this, this approach of saying like, oh, we have this great IP, we need to find a way to make something VR about it. It's, it's, it's like, completely wrong, Mike. Yeah. No, you have to, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the difficulty at the moment to see, for example, when it comes to film, a lot of initiatives that are more like kind of side products or companion apps and things like that, little spin-offs, just to, you know, 
It's a bit like a try and miss, which is also fair enough, something that we need to go through. Yeah. But so. the, 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 the motivation, like the, the fundamental motivation for the medium itself needs to change as well. The problem is most of the people, including us, don't know yet, you know, how to, how to exactly leverage all this, uh, all this new medium. We're right. still discovering. Right, but in terms of what, what the studios can do and, and what the journey is, do you see, for example, that these, you know, many of the studios would kind of turn into accelerators and invite people such as yourselves to, to come there and, and, and innovate and then sort of they give, there's a budget, let's see what happens. Well, that, that is happening, okay. um, and there are, some, there are some groups in Hollywood that actually are really embracing it. There, there are a few. There, there are a few, but they're, they're, they're there, and there are even some group, big groups that are doing it. So that's, um, uh, there's a group called Skydance, which is uh, uh, David Ellison's company, and David uh, is a gamer. So because he's a gamer, he understands this a little better. Uh, because the truth is, this is going to be driven from the gaming side initially, especially with PlayStation VR coming out. Uh, there's going to be a greater adoption from the gaming side, obviously, with what Valve is doing with Steam. I mean, you know, uh, games like Raw Data is an example. These, this is bringing the, the paradigm of VR to that world, and then that will seep into these other areas. So it also is going to be these other use cases like health and wellness. This is one of the places we're focused at virtuosity because we think there's, you know, entertainment's an optional thing. So another entertainment medium is another, you know, sort of optional choice for a consumer. But, you know, feeling good and and life extension and things like that, which VR has been proven to be a effective modality for. Uh, there's there's people that we brought on our team that actually are experts in this area, and we're bringing that data set into VR environments. I want to incorporate those kinds of things within the context of entertainment environments, because I think that VR can be, again, something that's beyond just entertainment. It's a connection of transformative experience with entertainment in a way that's never been done before. And these are the things that, of course, are hard because our language doesn't even exist to talk about this yet. So we're, you know, we're struggling just to bring these sort of metaphors together to even describe what we're talking about. Right. And yeah, I mean, talking about like the, the vast scope of what VR can bring yeah. to, to, to humanity. For example, something that we've been dreaming of for ever, time travel. Time travel exists today because of VR. Because VR gives you the presence in an alternate reality. So space and time travel exist today. Because you can actually go, you know, okay, watching a movie about something that happens in the past, in the future, and so on, you're just witnessing that. You're not in, the, you're not in that universe. You're not there. But today, actually, space and time travel suddenly exist through VR. And that's, for example, a very strong motivation for me to create some VR content, the idea of going any time and any place that I can dream of. Suddenly, I can do it. You know, speaking on that humanity, I think we, we touched on this yesterday. Uh, the reason I retired from VR, or all, uh, all of the existence that we uh, the have right now, is this phone. Everyone has one here. You're all addicts. You're an opium addict. Um, you're numbing yourself to the point where you're sitting at the dinner table and you're ignoring your entire family, or you have to put your phone away. So, I, you know, all, this deep con or sorry, all these connections were thought as deep connections, but they were just weak, weak, weak ties, which made us think that we were getting uh, even more connected with one another. Um, and so I thought, it was like, okay, wow, we're, we're numbing ourselves to this point, but now we've got VR where we slap this thing up to our face and we put on headphones and we completely tune out. We're not even numb anymore, we're completely tuned out, and I equate that to a heroin junkie. So we're moving into a heroin, um, you know, epidemic or pandemic, and so in that moment, I was like, wait a second, I'm in advertising. I push this kind of content out. I'm promoting this. I'm the biggest drug dealer in the world. I should be shot. And so I didn't think that we would, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think we would do that but well. I, and um, there was a moment where, you know, I was presented with a phone call and said, hey, you're the guy. We're, I'm doing this thing. Are you in or you're out? And when someone asks you to jump on a rocket ship, you don't ask what seat it is. So I had this moment where... You know, I was on my way, literally on my way to an island off the coast of Vancouver to live in bare feet. Uh, I had the internet and build an A-frame and just hang out so I didn't have to have a phone. I didn't have to be like part of the VR world. And uh, I think it was a week before I got this phone call, I had read something somewhere that 400 million less animals were killed last year. 
and it was, based, uh, it was because people chose a plant food based diet. And they didn't send out an email newsletter going, hey, we've got a 30 day challenge, let's do this, guys. Everyone took individual choices and collectively it changed and, and saved 400 million animals from being slaughtered. So in that moment, I thought, you know, I used to be, you know, a little bitter. I'm like, oh, be the change you want to see in the world. Yeah, bullshit. Um, one per person can make a difference. No, they can't. Um, resistance is futile. You have money that is greedy and advertising dollars are going to push things and ruin it all. And that's when I had that moment where I'm like, no, wait, one person can make a difference. So I got back into it so I could change the way we storytell news. Hollywood, that's great, but news? It's, an, it's infotainment. It, it, it's something that just gives a narrative. It's a bias, but the news is the narrative, or, or is the environment itself. That's the narrative, right? So uh, I came back in, uh, not as a drug dealer, but now I'm a farmer, and I plant seeds. And I hope one day that these flowers overpower all of those fucking weeds. Exactly. <laughs> Woo! And my second law of VR is that uh, it has to be about connecting people, not alienating us to the, a greater degree than already exists. Because if we don't focus the media in that direction, it can become the most alienated medium in the history of mankind. And that is just um, terrifying. And that's actually, I made two terrifying movies about exactly that. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't want to see what happens in movies that I'm thinking of actually happening in the real world. And that, uh, that's why this discussion is very important. Right. Do I have uh, time for one more question? I see one minute. One, I don't know if that's question, one, minute. one minute. Okay. I'm not sure if Your that's one, one question or one minute. So. Um, I just wanted to understand a bit about you, you're describing the sort of dystopia, um, what happens to culture in this kind of um, technological uh, environment. So we were talking about dating uh, yesterday, like people perhaps, you know, instead of going on that second date to see a, a rom-com, you know, uh, a shitty movie, they'll watch that shitty movie at home, um, you know, probably not go on that date. So uh, do you see those as, as real fears or, or are we just sort of... Uh, being afraid for nothing. This hardwires neuronic pathways. It changes your brain more than reality does. This is actual brain data that's out there right now. So there's something about this medium that creates a hyper-real experience. And because of that, the stakes are high. Do not underestimate virtual experience to affect real experience. That's my first law of VR. I think we uh, let's uh, get to close on that, right? Thank you. Thanks.